Evening, everyone. Welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I think we can kick it off. My name is Oscar. I am um, one of the provincial managers with uh, Standard Bank um, International Client Solutions. So we'd like to welcome you guys again. Um, I think just for context, I'll try and explain what it is that we do and how we are involved with the chamber. So we operate mainly out of um, the Isle of Man and Jersey. So those are the two jurisdictions that we work out of. We've got a team that's based in Africa. I'm part of that team. Uh, we have um, another team that either works in country, so different jurisdictions within Africa. Uh, we've got a team in Ghana, uh, Namibia, uh, Zimbabwe, and we've got a team that works uh, out of country. So that's a team that services other African countries from South Africa. So we've got a team that does Nigeria, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, and the DRC. Uh, we do fiduciary services uh, and we do general uh, offshore banking. So this is mainly for all the clients that want to diversify. So anyone who's either moving overseas or anyone who's in South Africa that uh, feels that they need to uh, have some of their wealth in more uh, stable currencies. So that's basically uh, the core of um, our function. And we have uh, quite a long-standing relationship with the Chamber. Uh, our relationship uh, has gone on now for about, about 10 years. Uh, we've got a senior business leader uh, from the bank that's um, in the advisory board. Uh, we are quite involved in uh, some of the prestigious uh, events. So they've got the awards that are coming up in November. Uh, we are a strategic partner in that. So these awards seek to recognize uh, anyone who's doing great work either in the UK uh, or in South Africa. So that's pretty much um, how uh, we are involved with the chamber. It's quite a symbiotic relationship, quite fruitful. Uh, and I think um, I will then hand over to Dr. Wendy Orr. Uh, she is uh, a former group head um, uh, of the bank, uh, recently retired. She'll come and speak to us uh, about uh, diversity and inclusion. Please give her a round of applause. Well, while, while we're waiting for the slides, let me just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I have been working in the diversity um, space since 1999, um, so that's 23 years now. I have been, well, I had been with Standard Bank for 10 years when I retired. I retired at the end of August. Um, I have to say I'm still trying to get used to the fact that I'm no longer gainfully employed, although I'm trying to gainfully employ myself at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so it's wonderful to come back to Standard Bank. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. The last time I was in this room, I was at my farewell party. So um, <laughs> it's nice to be back, even if only as, as a visitor. Um, in Standard Bank, I manage three different portfolios, a very eclectic <clears throat> mix. One was diversity and inclusion, obviously. The other was employee well-being. And the third was corporate social investment. So as I say, an, an interesting mix, but a lovely mix, and one which I really enjoyed because each of those spoke to uh, a different part of me and who I am and, and what I'm passionate about. So this evening, my topic is beyond diversity and inclusion. And why do I say beyond? That's because the conversation has now moved on to incorporate two other concepts. So what we talk about now is diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. And you need all three of the inclusion, equity, and diversity axes to be working and to be invested in, um, in order to find this place of overlap, this place of intersection, which is where people feel a sense of belonging in the organization. And when people feel that they belong, we, can, we are able to reap all the benefits of diversity. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about, about, about why that is. So this is... Um, the route that diversity and inclusion is now following, it's a bit of a mouthful to say diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging, so we need to find some um, appropriate acronym, um, but certainly the conversation is no longer just about D&I. 
I always believe it's very important to have a common understanding of what we're talking about. There are many different definitions of, of, of these words. These are my working definitions. Um, and this is one that I'm particularly fussy about. Diversity does not mean difference. Diversity means variety. So diversity is about the range of differences and similarities that you find um, across the human, the human state. Um, and why I think it's important is that while the differences are valuable because they bring different perspectives to the table and they drive innovation um, and, and, and problem solving, similarities make the connections. Um, and I want to give you an example. I worked for a long time in Standard Bank with um, a younger, in his 40s, African man who had grown up in rural Venda. So if you looked at Ntungu, here you have, you know, a young African man born in a rural area, Wendy, white woman, middle class, grew up in Pretoria. You know, you'd look at us and say, oh, my Lord, you are so different. But when we started talking to each other, we discovered that we both went to the University of Cape Town. So there's immediately a connection, a way in which we can, um, you know, connect with each other, understand with each other and engage with each other. And those connections are as important as the differences. And that's why I don't want us to only focus on difference when we talk about diversity. Equity and equality, um, they are not the same. Equality means you treat everybody exactly the same. Equity means you create the possibility of equal outcomes by treating people differently so they get what they need to thrive and succeed. So that might mean, as in this example, uh, if everybody wants to watch the cricket game over the fence and they're all different heights, there's no point in giving everybody the same size box because one person can see without a box, another person needs a little box, but the short dude he needs two boxes to stand on. And that's what equity is about. So we're not just saying, well, everybody is going to be treated blanket, exactly the same. We say, OK, what do you need in your particular circumstances, in your context, in order to, to succeed? You need to go on a leadership development program. You need to go on an IT, you know, crash course, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that people find it quite hard to grapple with this because we think equality is fair and we think people should be treated equally. Now, when we were all, if we were all exactly the same, we could all be treated equally, but we're not. And that's why we talk about equitable rather than equal treatment. An inclusive culture is one in which people can come to work, feel comfortable and confident to be themselves and able to work in a way that delivers on your business needs. In an inclusive workplace, everyone feels valued and that they add value. And I've highlighted that delivers on your business needs because this conversation is not just about warm fuzzy and let's all be nice to each other and rainbows and unicorns and you know, isn't this a wonderful world? This is a hard business conversation. We drive these issues because they will improve performance, productivity, outcomes, and they are a hard business issue. So we don't do it just because we're nice. We drive diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging because they make a difference to our business. Um, and, and, and obviously, if people feel valued and feel that they add value, they are going to show up in a very different way in the workplace, be more engaged, um, put in more discretionary effort. <clears throat> and finally, belonging is the sweet spot where all three of these intersect. And this is a definition from the Society for Human Resource Management, which I really like. Belonging is defined as the feeling of security and support when there is a sense of acceptance, inclusion, and identity for all employees. In order for people to feel like they belong, the environment, and in our case, we're talking about the workplace, needs to be set up to be a diverse, equitable, and inclusive place. So why does belonging matter? I mean, belonging is kind of the, 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 the last entrant to, to the conversation. Um, and belonging matters because when people feel like they belong, companies reap substantial bottom line benefits, High belonging was linked to a whopping 56% increase in job performance, 
50% drop in turnover and a 75% reduction in sick days. And that's from a study um, published in the Harvard Business Review. Um, similarly, there's a very close connection between belonging and well-being. If people feel that they belong, their mental, emotional, and physical well-being actually improves. Uh, so you can see how my employee well-being and DIE worlds um, collided and intersected. Um, and there are many, many studies that show that when we reach this place of belonging, that's when the true magic of diversity, inclusion, and equity are delivered. But we can't achieve inclusion or belonging without psychological safety. Psychological safety is also, I mean, I hope it's not a buzzword. I hope it's something that businesses are taking really seriously and it's not a passing fad. But psychological safety is a concept um, that was first named um, and identified and spoken about by Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School. And she defines it as, Psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. So it's an environment in which you feel safe to speak up, you feel safe to disagree, you feel safe to name the elephant in the room, um, and you know that you will not be dismissed. It will not be a career-limiting move. You will not be laughed at because you've said something silly. Um, you will be heard, your opinion will be valued, um, and will be taken seriously. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we are nice to everybody. It doesn't mean that we don't criticize, but it's about the way in which criticism is managed, the way in which feedback is given. Um, can either make you feel completely dismissed and belittled, or it can actually make you think and say, well, okay, I could have done that differently. This is how I can improve. This is how I will do it next time. Um, this is a model that uh, uh, an ex-colleague uh, at Standard Bank, she's still with Standard Bank, um, and, and, and I developed to talk about what kind of environment you need for psychological safety, what the lead indicators are, and then what the outcomes will be. So the environment you need to create is to give people the space to speak up with the assurance that they will be heard. But then there needs to be a sense of personal agency as well. Um, I then need to step into that space and speak my truth. And we will know that people are feeling safe if they bring their best selves to work, they speak confidently about what is important, whether that's something you know, easy to talk about or difficult to talk about, and they receive authentic attention and listening. Now, Amelia, she's the colleague, and I had a great debate about this bringing your best self to work. She wanted to say bring your authentic self to work. And a, a lot of people who talk about these issues do use that phrasing. Um, I've always been hesitant to, to use those terms because uh, sometimes your authentic self is actually not the self we want in the workplace. Um, unfortunately, uh, we want people who subscribe to or who behave in a way that subscribes to the values and culture of the organization. I did some fascinating work with Transnet, God, many, many years ago. Um, I was with a, a, a consultancy and we'd done a lot of, of consultancy work with Transnet on um, their culture. But then they were also particularly concerned about sexual harassment. So I went down to Durban to do focus groups um, with the men in Transnet Rail Engineering, which is an incredibly macho environment. So to do focus groups with them about sexual harassment, because as Transnet was bringing more women into the environment, this was proving to be an issue. Um, and I kind of opened with saying that, you know, I know you're probably looking at me and saying this is a white woman and she doesn't understand our Zulu culture and she mustn't come and tell us how we must behave and what's okay and what's not okay. So I'd like to know what you think about it. And one man stood up and he said, when I walk through the gates of Transnet, I take on the company culture and the company values, and that's how I'm expected to behave. And I think that was really very powerful, and it was you know, quite an aha moment for me in terms of how we expect people to show up at work. Anyway, that was a little diversion, apologies. Um, but that's why we want people's best selves. We want them to be 
the best that they can be in the workplace. And the outcomes, if we create this environment, is that people will feel free to share new ideas because they won't be told that they're being ridiculous. They will point to the issues hindering our progress. They will experiment and be able to make mistakes, not too often. I don't think we tolerate mistakes that get repeated over and over again. But certainly when you're experimenting, mistakes have to be allowed. Um, and we will create an environment in which we can reflect constructively and honestly um, on learnings. And so at the end of the day, it's all about being truly human. And I love it that Satya Nadella, who's the CEO of Microsoft, said this, because as we know, Microsoft is a tech company. So to have the CEO talking about human attention is really, I think, very powerful. Um, and he said the true scarce commodity of the near future will be human attention. And that's what it's all about. It's about authentic attention. It's about really listening. It's about really engaging um, with, with our people in the workplace. I sometimes worry that diversity, equity, and inclusion are seen as a kind of a thing that happen on the side. Uh, you know, let HR go away and manage this particular issue. Um, it's not really a hard business um, thing that we need to worry about. Um, but more and more, the thinking is that for an organization and its employees to be the most successful, a culture that merely supports diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is not enough. Rather, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging must be the cultural foundation upon which the organization is built. That's quite a challenge. Um, I'm not sure that there are any organizations who can say that, that, that they have met this challenge yet, but I think it's certainly something worth thinking about. We don't do DIEB in a silo. We don't abdicate responsibility to the human resources business partner. This has to be a business imperative for the entire organization. And of course, it starts with leaders. Um, Deloitte have done some really interesting work on the characteristics of an inclusive leader, and this is a model that they've developed, which I really like. Um, it's called the 6C the six model, and they say that in order to be an inclusive leader, and I think, I mean, quite honestly, I think this is in order to be a leader. Sometimes I wonder why we say inclusive leader, effective leader, servant leader, you know, compassionate leader. Let's just say this is what you need to be a leader, and, and, and inclusion is, is, is part of that role. Um, it's cognizance. You have to be aware of your own biases, of your own shortcomings, of your own blind spots. Curiosity. I gave you the example of Ntungu. If we hadn't been curious about each other, we would never have found out that we both went to UCT. Um, cultural intelligence, so an understanding of where people are coming from and the kind of backgrounds that have formed them. Collaboration, obviously, I think that goes without saying. Commitment, because this is hard. Um, it's really hard. And that's why I think so many organizations are still struggling with it. Um, it also takes time. It's not something that happens overnight. So there has to be commitment and you have to be willing to stay the course. And then finally, courage. Because I think particularly for leaders to declare their vulnerabilities is really, really sometimes quite scary. Um, and so we need people to be courageous, to be willing to speak out, um, to be willing to speak their truth. And this is a metaphor that I like to use to bring it all together. Diversity is being invited to the dinner party. So you have a diverse group of people. Um, Inclusion is having a seat at the table. Imagine how terrible it would be to arrive at a dinner party and suddenly realize that there's no place sitting for you and there's nowhere for you to sit. Um, equity is being given an equal opportunity to have your say. Belonging is being heard and having your views taken seriously. And obviously, inclusion, equity, and belonging form a critical component of culture, and culture is a critical part of ensuring that you eventually um, evolve into an inclusive, equitable organization where people feel that they belong. That's um, my piece, and I think uh, we're now going to have a, a, a Q&A session. Thank you. Maybe you want to introduce yourself, Colleen. 
<laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I'm Haleen. I'm from Parks Consulting SA, and I'm part of the chamber in the Expo group. That was a lovely presentation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so can you give us some organ um, examples of organisations that are doing well in the space and what they are actually doing? I'm just going to get my cheat sheet. <laughs> I made notes. Um, I mean, perhaps before I go to particular organizations, um, to talk about some of the characteristics of organizations that are, are doing well. Um, and this is probably, you know, self-evident, but I'll say it anyway, um, is that leadership is absolutely key. Leaders have to lead this endeavor. Um, as I say, it's not something that you leave to middle management, although middle managers obviously play a critical role, but the tone has to be set from the top. And, and if it's not, you know, you can actually forget about this ever succeeding. The other thing is that most organizations which are doing well in the space have a very senior chief diversity officer. And this chief diversity officer is not always located in HR. In some organizations, they're in the strategy office, which is really interesting. Um, in some organizations, they're in finance, which I think is even more interesting. Um, but it shows that, that these issues are being incorporated as a hard business deliverable. Um, so it's generally someone who, who reports directly to the CEO or to the CEO minus, minus one. Um, so just to name a couple of organizations, and, and perhaps to preface that with saying that no one is getting this 100% right. It's a journey which probably doesn't have an end, unfortunately. We are always going to have to be working on it, um, checking ourselves, evaluating ourselves, um, and, and, and making sure that we are engaging constantly around what's working and um, what's not working. And I think this whole concept of psychological safety is particularly complex, and it's a difficult and ongoing endeavor, nevertheless, to organizations. Um, Google has done a huge amount of work on psychological safety. They're kind of the poster child of, of, of psychological safety um, and have created an environment where people do speak up. Um, and I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why Google is so innovative is because they have created that 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 kind of sense um, where people can say anything, no matter how ridiculous it might seem. Um, Price Waterhouse Coopers, and I'm talking about the, the the global office, has taken a very solid data-driven approach. So they don't sort of guess what the problem might be. You know, so if women are underrepresented in senior positions, they don't say oh, well, it's because women are getting pregnant and leaving. Um, they actually go to the data, they interrogate the data, and in fact, what they found out was it wasn't women leaving. It was the fact that when women did leave, as people do, they were being replaced by men. So they knew what the problem was. They then devised a solution to speak specifically to that problem. Um, and one of the ways in which they addressed that, that women weren't being appointed, was to hardwire bias mitigation into their people processes. And they are these are absolute non-negotiables. Um, it is led by the chief executive officer from the top, um, and they are absolutely insistent that processes have to have bias mitigation hardwired into it. And the reason is that we are all biased. We all suffer from or embrace our unconscious biases. And the clue is in the name. Unconscious bias is unconscious. Um, it's very hard to catch yourself in the moment of making a decision and say, ooh, is that bias, you know, what's informing it? So if you hardwire bias mitigation into your processes, you then start to counteract that danger. And then the other organization that I'd like to mention is Unilever. And what's what I like about their approach is it's very holistic. Um, the chief diversity officer reports directly to the CE, and their DIEB work um, sits on multiple legs. There's the internal work with employees, organizational culture, et cetera. They have another leg about suppliers and external partners, where they see you know, DIEB as equally important. Um, and then finally, they have um, started a very strong focus 
on marketing and advertising. Now Unilever makes things like household cleaning pro you know, products, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very hard to for, for their adverts to be stereotypical, you know, women's washing the dishes, et cetera, et cetera. And they've made a very active effort to make sure that the adverts do not display stereotypical images of men or women or black people or white people or people with um, disabilities, which I think is very exciting. And finally, they've linked their DIEB efforts to the Sustainable Development Goals, which I think is a really interesting way to go about it. So it's taking it from something that's not only dealt with inside the organization, but which is of societal and global relevance um, as well. So those are just three. There are others. Um, do you think legislative instruments like the Employment Equity Act and Triple BEE are working to support in inclusion and diversity? That's a million dollar question, of course. <clears throat> I think they have the potential to. Um, but the way in which they are currently framed is very formulaic, very un unnuanced, very numbers driven. And I'm not saying numbers and targets are important. They're absolutely essential. But there's a, there's, there's a failure to, to think beyond the numbers, to think about so, so these acts certainly don't drive inclusion. They may drive a diversification of the demography of your workforce. They won't deliver inclusion. Um, I think it also comes down to how compliance is measured. I don't know if any of your organisations have ever been um, subjected to a Section 43 DG Employment Equity Review. It is a very miserable experience. It does nothing to encourage you to engage with the employment equity endeavor. It is punitive. It is critical. Um, and I think it could be done so differently. It, it could be a partnership with the Department of Employment and Labor where we, we say, OK, this isn't working. Our numbers aren't great. What can we do in, in, in order to improve them? Um, so, so I do think the, the way in which the, the acts are implemented are not always um, particularly helpful. So I think they definitely keep the challenge top of mind. Um, I, I do think that diversification of the demography of the workforce has been supported by employment equity legislation, but I think we could do much better. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would give to organizations that would like to create a more inclusive and equitable environment? I found it hard to come up with only one. <laughs> um, I think I've said this already, leadership, Leadership, leadership. So there's three. Um, leaders have to be committed to the endeavor. They cannot abrogate responsibility um, to the next level down or to, to a particular area in the organization. But it's also really important to view diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging as a business imperative and to measure and evaluate it in the same way as you do any other business deliverable. So in the same way as you measure performance, productivity, output, financial um, results, you need to have the same sort of metrics um, to, for, for, for DIEB, and you need to hold people accountable in the same way as you do for financial results. Um, so those, those are the things that I, would, that I would suggest are a good starting point. Thank you, Wendy. I think we're going to open questions to the floor. Hi, uh, my name is Malini Padiachi Salman. I'm CEO of MPA Mott. Um, Wendy, your talk was absolutely phenomenal, and it touched on a number of points that I think uh, many of us are grappling with. I come from the construction sector, um, and it's got a 6.6% female representation from a diversity perspective, very low. So I have two questions for you. The one is, um, do you think um, when you look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, do you think a one-size-fits-all approach is appropriate? Or should we be not looking at something that's almost tailor-made to ensure? Because you cannot implement um, an inclusive environment if you don't have an inclusive uh, number of people around the table. That is the biggest challenge, actually. So do you not think then in, in where it is inequitable and where we know our numbers are 
nowhere close to where it should be, that we should start really be looking at policies that changes that. And when you talk about like the Employment Equity Act and things, because that's where you could possibly initiate real change. So um, I know your comments on that would be appreciated if I go on to the next. A couple of things. First of all, it absolutely has to be context appropriate. The way in which you, you, you pursue the endeavor in a bank is not the way you would do it in a mine, is not the way you would do it in a tech company, is not the way you would do it in a construction company. You face different challenges. Um, you know, yours is the representation of women. I think in mining it may be similar. You know, in a bank it may be the representation of African people, for example. So you're right. Um, and I, I do think policies, practices, and procedures are a critical component in creating, first of all, a diverse workforce, um, but, but then in, in, in this whole aspect of equity as well. Um, so I don't want you to go with, away with the impression that because I think the Employment Equity Act is not delivering everything it should, that I'm saying we don't need those kind of formal processes. Um, we absolutely do. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Wendy, for this powerful presentation. My name is uh, Cindy Somzamo from the sector of global business women. The other critical thing that I've just came across in my past life as a corporate executive in terms of inclusion was the role of women in the C-suite when you're talking about shattering the glass ceiling and also the role of men, because I think it's very important so that we don't discuss, discard the role of men in assisting women to shatter that glass ceiling. Because if you look at the I mean, global corporate, it's made of men. And also if women want to be part of that global corporate in the C-suite positions, whether they like it or not, they must work with men. And I find it so difficult. Some women don't understand that part. And I think in terms of inclusion and diversity, we need to look at that and how do we, you know, make women to understand that they cannot discard men, even if that sector is a male dominated. We need to understand men will exist for life. But how do we make sure that we have a program that says generation equality? How do we make sure that we're in the same position? I'm a chief investment banker. My colleague next door is a chief investment banker. But she must understand that I've got a role and also gender pay gap, gender pay gap as well. I've got a role to play as Cindy without competing with her, with, with my colleague, but giving me that opportunity. So it becomes a psychological issue as well in, in, the, in, in corporate South Africa or corporate Africa or corporate global. How do we make sure that in the future we come up with a strategy that embraces that particular point? Thank you. I think um, I agree with you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the he for she movement. Um, but I think in as much as women need to understand that in order to succeed, they need to work with men, I think men need to understand that in order to succeed, they need to work with women. It's a two-way thing. Um, but you're absolutely right. As long as people in decision-making positions are men, we have to engage men and encourage them to participate in the gender equity endeavor. We cannot do it without men. When women got the vote in the UK back in 19 Futsap, it wasn't women who gave themselves the vote, it was the men in parliament who decided or who, who, who agreed that women could have the vote. Um, and I think the, the danger of a very radical feminist Stance, which ex excludes men, means that men feel alienated. They feel that they have no role to play. Um, they, you know, so they either say, oh, well, I'm going to step away because clearly no one wants me, or they say, well, I'm going to carry on doing exactly what I've always done because, you know, these women seem to, to, to think that I add no value anyway. Um, and I think it was on the basis of this understanding that the He for She movement was, was initiated by UN Women. And that was specifically 
to engage men in the conversation, um, in the initiatives, in the endeavor to drive gender equity. I'm very proud that Sim Tabalala, uh, the Standard Bank Chief Executive, signed up as a he for she champion. And a lot of the work we, we did around gender in, in, in the last few years was off the back of that. But yes, I absolutely agree. Engaging men in the conversation is essential. Okay, Wendy, we've got somebody on the webinar who's asked, inclusion and inclusive mindset is needed first. The, deliver, the deliveries belonging and drive successful diversity outcome, allowing equity to be delivered to all. And then it goes on to say, men need to be supported to engender a micro-inclusive culture. That sounds like more of a comment than a question. Yeah, well, more. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I think we've spoken to the issue of uh, the, the the last issue about men. I I have to say I don't think it's a one comes first in the diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, you know, first we develop an inclusive mindset, then we drive diversity, then we. It doesn't work that way. You have to be working on all three vectors at the same time in order to, to deliver that sense of belonging. So, yes, an inclusive mindset is essential, um, but, but that's, not, that's not number one, as it were. Thank you. Um, my name is Mudali from Values Foundation. Um, the program that I teach is the Ethical Literacy Program, right? Um, one of the things that you mentioned about psychological safety in the work environment to create that. How do you go about creating that in, well, if you take Standard Bank, it's a large corporation. There's thousands of employees. The environment is large. Um, what formula do you use to achieve that? Um, what other alternatives that mm -hmm. you have in mind? I, I wish there was a formula. <clears throat> And I'm going to be completely honest with you and say the psychological safety conversation only started in Standard Bank last year. Um, so it's not as if we are, we, I keep on saying we, and I'm no longer part of Standard Bank. No, not as if they <laughs> are very far um, on this particular journey. Um, I, I, I think it requires um, a very different style of management to, to what the traditional is. Um, so that is going to mean intensive engagement with managers around leadership and management style and around humanity. I mean, that's ultimately at the end of the day what it is. It's about being, you know, human at heart. It's about giving people your attention. Uh, so it's, it's, it's certainly not something that can be delivered overnight. I think it's going to be a multifactorial type of intervention um, that has to happen at all levels. Um, and it's not only leadership and management, it's employees themselves who need to find that sense of personal agency. So I'm sorry, I can't give you the formula. I think it's going to be difficult. I think it's going to require a whole range of interventions um, and it's going to require quite fundamental change. I think that's it for questions. Thank you very much, Wendy. This Thank was you. a very insightful presentation. We just want to thank you for taking your time out from retirement and doing this lovely event with us. So we want to thank you from thank you. Thank you so South much. Africa Chamber UK and especially the Halteng chapter. So um, thank you everybody who's attended. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much. And I'm sure this comes from sharing as well.